We look to turn our customers into fans. We want them to come back and ask us to solve other problems for them. Today, I'm chatting with Robin Sates, CMO of Rockwell Automation, a global leader in industrial automation and digital transformation. What is it like to lead marketing at an organization that isn't traditionally probably a marketing-led organization, generally more of a technology or engineering-led organization? I prefer to approach it from a solution perspective. We're about solving customer problems. And the way we can solve a customer problem is different depending on what industry they're in or depending on their maturity level. And it's about this idea of providing amazing customer experiences and prospect experiences in the buying process. You were talking about customer experience, but this idea that customer experience starts during the marketing and sales process. When you focus on them and their business challenge and what they're trying to achieve, the customer's gonna have a much better experience through the selling process and hopefully become a fan and wanna do business with us. What, what have you been able to accomplish five months and what does the next five months after this look like? I'm trying to bring in new ways of thinking around our approaches to... Welcome to Top CMO. I'm chatting with Robin Sates, CMO of Rockwell Automation. And Robin, um, first of all, you're CMO at a, you know, a company that's known for its industrial automation. The nature of, of, of its work is changing as you acquire other software companies and, ex, and expand into other areas. But what is it like to lead marketing at an organization that isn't traditionally probably a marketing-led organization, generally more of a technology or engineering-led organization. Thanks, Ben, for uh, having me today. Uh, you know, what I would say is that Rockwell Automation has a very long history. We've been around for um, 120 years, and the company is very well known in the industrial automation space to the point where um, I, I love to share the story about um, my father. So when I took this job, my father was so excited because he had been in the materials handling um, and pollution control business for his entire career. And he knew Rockwell Automation from his years uh, in, in the business. And so it has just a very, very strong brand and very well known, like I said, in industrial automation. But as the company has been transforming over the last, um, you know, five, six, seven, ten years or so, um, the the marketing side becomes much more important so that we can um, reinforce and communicate how the company is transforming amongst those who know us and then also establish the brand in its evolved way it, um, with those who don't know us. And you come in um, specifically um, as part of an acquisition, of an acquisition of a software company as, as Rockwell Automation you know, changes from maybe hardcore physical manufacturing of things um, to become more of a software company. So what is it like to, to one, be, be, be acquired and have a new culture and you have to merge all of that? And, and two, um, to be one of a number of acquisitions, Rockwell's growing through acquisition. How do you think about that as a marketer when the players can change, new cultures have to be merged, and you yourself had to think about that? Yeah, it, it was interesting for me. Um, I had... Uh, I had uh, a long time ago, I worked for um, PTC for many, many years, and we acquired, I don't know, 25 different businesses while I was working there. And so I had been on that end of uh, the acquisition process and now being acquired by Rockwell through the Plex Systems acquisition um, was, uh, was a new experience for me. And, you know, I have to say Rockwell in its acquisition strategy um, really appreciates not just the asset that comes over, in our case, a software solution, smart manufacturing, smart, plat um, smart manufacturing platform solution in, in our Plex system solution, um, but also all of the people and the expertise that come with it. So, you know, again, Rockwell, deep, deep domain expertise in manufacturing in industrial automation and has been in the software business over the years. But what Rockwell saw in Plex Systems and other acquisitions that it has made is not just the um, the assets and the products they're purchasing, but also the expertise that the um, employees of those companies bring to the company. And um, 
And joining Rockwell, we felt that, you know, we felt the pull from um, people who've worked at Rockwell for many years who wanted to learn from the um, the folks at Plex and about um, software as a service and cloud solutions and how do you sell and market and um, and develop those sol solutions perhaps differently than um, other types of products that uh, Rockwell has um, offered in the past and bring that expertise over to um, infuse into the rest of the Rockwell culture. And how do you, you know, I think one of the things that, that is interesting when you look at Rockwell Automation overall now is that I think the company has, as we've chatted about before, elevated different people that came from other disciplines. And there was a, a, a willingness to do that. And you yourself were, were, were elevated into the CMO role. How does that work successfully? I, I've been a part and we have a global marketing agency. So I, I've, I've seen the opposite, right? Where a company acquires, you know, all the people and gosh, one or two years later, that those whole teams are, are actually gone. Either people right. are fed up and they resign or the, the position's removed. It, it worked the opposite in your case. And I think other CMOs might be interested to see how does that sort of successfully work the integration and people are, 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 are welcomed and maybe even elevated. Yeah, I mean, I think that there was um, a tremendous amount of respect shown by um, Rockwell leadership and Rockwell employees towards um, the employees that came in through the acquisition that I joined through Plex Systems. Um, and they uh, they sort of, you know, uh, ring fenced us a little bit and said, keep doing what you're doing. There wasn't like an immediate type of integration, just like put us in and, and deploy us into all of the other functions in the organization. But instead, they had an opportunity to see us in action in the way that we worked, um, something that you wouldn't normally see in a diligence process, right? Because usually those are a short period of time and you don't get full exposure to that. But they got to see us in action and they got to know us. And we worked very closely with um, Rockwell leadership. And over time, they, um, they gave me the marketing leadership role. Um, our head of uh, software development in the production um, operations management area is um, a Plex employee. Our head of product management is also um, a, a Plex employee. And our head of sales for all software is um, a Plex, uh, is our former Plex uh, chief revenue officer. So they, um, they saw the experiences that we had and they got to know us. And they asked us a lot of questions. They listened to us and our observations. And, you know, moving into a role like this, I had to do a lot of listening. I think I spent the first three months or so, because it's a very large company, I spent a lot of time listening to all different parts of the organization um, and understanding what they felt was working, where they thought we could make um, differences and, and not making rash changes immediately, but just really understanding things. And then beginning to infuse my own experiences into, in my case, the marketing strategy. So, so where are you now? You're about sort of about eight months in, I, I, I think around that to, to kind of the elevation to the around CMO that. role. You, you did your three months of, of listening. That leaves about five months you know, after that, let's say, after your listening tour. Um, what are you trying to get through? What's on the agenda? Because it's also a a company that is transforming as well into the next iteration of Rockwell. What what have you been able to accomplish five months and what does the next five months after this look like? Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at, um, I'm trying to bring in new ways of thinking around our approaches to um, integrated campaigns, for example. And really, um, not that Rockwell hasn't been because Rockwell is a customer-driven organization through and through and really understanding what's most important to customers. But in our marketing approach, we've had opportunities to um, look deeply at what matters to our customers and understand their buying behaviors and tune our marketing campaigns to that type of market intelligence. That's something that I've always done in my previous roles, my previous marketing leadership roles. And here at Rockwell is the same thing, is making sure that we're looking at our um our marketing campaigns in a very integrated way, thinking about the market intelligence that's going to inform what we do, thinking about um, whether or not campaigns are demand generating, whether or not they're about lifting up the brand, and always making sure that our sales organizations and our partner organizations are prepared to catch any demand or interest that we generate. And so looking at that in a very integrated way is, um, 
is an important uh, way of thinking that I'm bringing to our marketing organization. We also have well, a, th- la- yeah, go ahead, Ben. Oh, no, you, sorry, you were going to say you also have a. Well, we also have a, um, a large flagship um, event that we do every year that Rock- Rockwell's been doing for a couple of decades called Automation Fair. And I went to my first Automation Fair last November, and there are, th- there are new ways of thinking that we're bringing to um, Automation Fair and, and uh, continuing to, to elevate the brand through that, but also bringing new experiences to, um, to those events. So, so what and what does it mean like to get specific? What's an example of like more integration? If it's more integrated that you're doing now, where it would have been, you know, I don't know, more siloed before. What's an example of something that just operates, you know, differently, or or you'd like to operate differently? Yeah, I think you know, for me, as I said, sort of in that final comment about partner and sales enablement, like my, personally, I feel like don't bother running those campaigns unless the partners and the and the sales organization are available are ready to catch the demand and so thinking through the um, the full life cycle of a campaign and the tactics that are informed by our buyers behavior you know it's our job as marketers to be where our buyers are in their buyer's journey we know that the buyer's journey is not a straight line especially many of our solutions are more of an enterprise solutions um, selling process. And so it involves many people. So deeply understanding our personas, understanding their language and leading with their language, because we we should not lead with all about Rockwell and how great Rockwell is and our great products. We should lead with our customers' business challenge and what business outcomes they're trying to achieve and only until we've earned the right to start talking about uh, Rockwell do we then begin to introduce how we can solve their problems. But we have to earn that right. And our tactics need to be aligned in a way that allow the customer to um, connect with us and help them understand that we really understand their business. And then we can, bre- we can begin to bring in things like products and solutions and services and software and all the things that we sell. But leading with that doesn't really make sense and it doesn't help bring the customer along in their process. Well, and, and how do you think about, you know, messaging, you know, kind of being empathetic with the customer, putting yourself in their shoes? I, I was chatting with the the CMO of, of SAP, um, you know, big enterprise software company. And one of the things, you know, he said to me was, well, it's the difference between um, do you message the individual parts of the ham sandwich? like the bread, the cheese, the ham, the lettuce, or do you be like, we have a ham sandwich for you. Here's the ham sandwich. And then we can go in and explain the different components and other things like that. Like, how do you think about messaging from a customer point of view, but you can still say customer point of view, we got some ham for you. Or we can say customer point of view, I've got the whole ham sandwich for you uh, as well. Yeah, I prefer to approach it from a solution perspective. Again, just like the, the SAP CMO talked about, we're about solving customer problems. And the way we can solve a customer problem is different depending on what industry they're in or depending on their maturity level. And so, and we have lots of solutions. That, like I said, I mean, the company's been around 120 years. We have, you know, so many um, hardware and software solutions. Um, and so it's our job to help uh, configure and deliver that solution to the customer, but also to help them find it on their own in their own process right because they chances are if they we need to we need to balance both so if a customer already knows they want um a distributed control system we need to have optimized our um our uh our search engine optimization so that they find us for that but if they know that they are just trying to um they're just they're trying to optimize production and they're not exactly sure what components they need we need to be found for that reason as well. So again, as I said before, we want to meet the customer where they are in their buyer's journey um, and in their maturity model and um, make sure that we are found and we can connect with them in that process. Well, and, and that brings up a good point. And I think you learn that, especially, I mean, you, you referenced the SEO example. That's one marketing discipline where it's very, very apparent of like this idea of like customer intent, right? So where are they? Is it like, I just want to know, you know, I want to price you against four other widgets. And I just want to know yeah. they are because I'm ready to buy. And I just want to know now. That's right. Is it that I'm 
doing some research and I generally think this is the solution I want, but I just want to confirm it. Just want to know and just have some reassurance that I've made the right decision. Is it a much earlier in the process? And, you know, I may have five different ways to solve something. You have, you make one of the five, but I might be all over the place and I have four other ways that I'm solving something. Or is it just that, you know, I've been introduced to Rockwell Automation some other way at a conference, at something else. And it's like, I had to check out this company and, and I don't even know what area I'm playing in. I just think you might be able to help me. How, if you're customer led or customer focused, they need to go to different places for all of That's those right. things, depending where they are. They can't go to all the same place. I love that. I love your question because it's it's exactly what we deal with every single day. And um, the a great example of this is um, what I we we've created what we call the anatomy of a of a um, marketing sourced deal. And when this particular example is interesting, so we are we've done in marketing our homework. So we've done what we call um, watering hole studies. So we understand where buyers go in their buyer's journey to get information when they're buying solutions like ours. We've done that for a number of different personas and buying groups. And we know, for example, that industry analysts are very influential in the buying process. We also know that peer reviews and peer connections are very influential in the buying process for manufacturers and solving problems that we solve. Um, and so, we work really hard, for example, just recently we were just announced as a leader in the Gartner Magic Quadrant for manufacturing execution um, systems. Well, a couple of years ago, we were in, maybe we were in the challenger box um, at the time, and we had a customer come to us, a prospect come to us inbound um, because the industry analyst had referred them to us using this Magic Quadrant. And that customer that prospect was not even in our database. We were not marketing to them at all. They found us because we were in that particular asset and that industry review, that industry analyst review. And then we were able to see their behavior online and all the different tactics that they engaged with. And when they qualified and we were able to pass them over to our um, sales development team and how sales and marketing worked together all the way to close that particular deal. And I love that example because it, it shows that it's not a straight line. Sometimes it is. We do have some high velocity solutions that we sell very quickly. And that process is a shorter process but and has fewer people involved in it. But we need to be prepared it, at Rockwell in our marketing organization to be able to serve all different kinds of buying processes because we have solutions that are you know, sold quickly and some that take a longer process to sell and have many more people involved in the buying buying process. So we have to be there along the way. We need to explore things like intent and help. What I like to say about intent with our sales organization is we try to make the haystack smaller for you, right? So that you can find the needle in the haystack with intent versus all the companies you could possibly be contacting. So we use that as a tactic as well. So we look at all of those different tactics, Ben, and there's no one answer depending on, um, because we're a very large company and we have many different types of solutions that we sell. Well, and, and, and how do you think about, I mean, you highlighted two things. You highlighted sort of analysts, right? Which, which are sort of, you know, have a, have a title that identifies them as like influential in an industry. So you can, you can reach out to analysts. You have, you mentioned peer reviews. So those are, no one has an official title, but they, they work in the industry. That's important. How do you think about tracking those relationships or what do you do? Because it tends to be this, this like, Oh, that's great. It's like lightning struck in a bottle, right? Someone, we would talk to the analyst, the analyst spoke to someone, they referred the person. You had to do a good job in in, in, in tracking that deal and closing that deal. And there's a lot that went into closing that. So, so team gets credit, but you want more of those moments. So is there anything you do to track, I don't know, the key relationships in certain industries, the ones you have to nurture um, at your conference, other ones? How do you think about that? Because a lot of people think about relationships or networking as like a warm and fuzzy process that is hard to scale. It's valuable, but how do we scale it? Yeah. Well, we do have, I mean, we do have an analyst relations team and we have, you know, press and media team that are, um, who are identifying key influencers in the, um, in the ecosystem. And we stay in close contact with them and stay tight with them as well. You know, the other thing that we have is we have this fantastic what we call results achieve campaign, which really highlights our customer successes. 
And so, you know, I mentioned peer reviews and peer networking, um, which is the softer side of that. But we also try to capture those stories and leverage those stories in a wide variety of marketing tactics. Um, and so we nurture our relationships with our customers. We like to say we um, we look to turn our customers into fans, right? So we we have, I don't know if you're familiar with David Meerman Scott and his work, but he came out with um, a, a book recently called Fanocracy a couple of years ago. And it's about this idea of providing amazing customer experiences and prospect experiences in the buying process so that a, a company does become a customer. And then once they do become a customer, turning them into fans, because this is a virtuous cycle, right? We want them to, in particularly in the SaaS space, we want them to renew their um, their engagement with us. But we also want them in a company like Rockwell that has a very large portfolio of solutions, we want them to come back and ask us to solve other problems for them. So um, tracking the... Um, tracking the engagement with our customers and prospects as a way to um, highlight them through our marketing tactics is important, but then also providing them with those, you know, peer-to-peer -peer opportunities that they get at, you know, attending Automation Fair, for example, or any any number of events that we might offer. We look at all of that. And, and, and I think one thing that is interesting, um, you know, when, when you talk to a lot of you know, large companies in competitive industries, a lot of people will talk about share of voice, right? So if there's like thought leadership, if there's a discussion of a topic, what's our, you know, if, and the entire pie is every, uh, the whole discussion, what's our slice of the pie, which, which is important, especially important for thought leadership. One thing I think doesn't get talked about as much that is important with these relationships is, is, is what we call share of mind. What share of mind is, it doesn't necessarily mean like the published article that was in, you know, the industry trade magazine or, or newsletter, or whatever. I mean, that's, that's important, but share of mind is, you know, Hey, there's 400 people in this industry who really matter to us. Some are analysts, yeah. some are peers, some are journalists, writers, some are others. And how many of them, you know, know that we're in the space, how many of them, you know, can, exp you know, ex ex explain where we fit, you know, maybe in that wet magic quadrant, maybe someone else, how many of them know that we've got some really like innovative solutions or a really customer focused approach. And so I think, one opportunity, and just hearing you talk about that, it just reminded me of of sort of being able to track that, that share of mind. And that's almost like in, in sort of data studies, we deal with leading indicators and lagging indicators. Leading indicator is like share of mind. The lagging indicator is share of voice. So when you get share yeah. of mind with the right people, then you get share of voice and maybe you get the deal flow later on once you have that's that right. kind of uh, awareness. But it's a tougher thing to track. So we need those kind of metrics. It is, it is for sure a tougher thing to track, but is, as I say, like, you know, um, as I talk about uh, performance of campaigns, for example, just because a particular campaign flipped one prospect from, you know, interested to um, at a lead doesn't mean all the things that we did leading up to that moment in time weren't important. In fact, they were probably more important, right, in their engagement, even though they didn't score high enough until they did X, Y, Z. And so that's, again, why I like to think about our campaigns in a very integrated way, because all of the tactics that we do, developing those relationships with influencers and engaging with them, getting them involved in some of the tactics that we, that we, um, that we run. You know, we recently um, released our State of Smart Manufacturing um, report that we do annually and working with the influencers to brief them on it so that they're aware of it and begin to share it them share it themselves amongst their network of people is really important but it's hard for us to draw a straight line from XYZ influencer who shared the state of smart manufacturing report to you know um, Joe Smith who does you know who's the uh, leader of product production operations at a particular food and beverage company it's hard to make that direct connection but I wouldn't say don't do that because we can't make the direct connection finding ways to measure it and and track it would be would, would be fantastic. Well, and 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 interesting the other point I thought you made that was interesting was you were talking about customer experience. Obviously important because you want to renew customers, you want them to be lifetime customers. Um, but this idea that customer experience starts during the 
marketing and sales process, that it doesn't oh, start sure. when they sign the contract and that that experience there matters. And, and to me, that's relevant to what you said before about being integrated. And you were talking about integration with sales, integration with customer success, integration with product teams, because if you're not integrated, it's not likely to be a great customer experience. And if customer experience starts then, then we've all got to communicate and talk together when, when you when work together, wouldn't you say? That's right. And in fact, recently we had um, a sales, a global sales leadership meeting where we specifically talked about the role sales plays in turning fans into customers, essentially making fans from the experience that they um, that they offer to our customers in the way we engage. And our approach to selling is this idea of outcome-based selling, which is value-based selling. Um, and, and it leads with, again, a, a salesperson who's done their research before they go in and talk to the customer the first time and make sure they understand what's publicly available. And then letting them know that they have been doing that research and listening and asking more questions and not leading again with the Rockwell story, but instead understanding what ABC company is doing and what their what their priorities are. And and each subsequent meeting that they have with that customer should reiterate and reinforce, this is what I heard the last time. What's changed, Mr. or Mrs. Customer, since the last time we met? And I'm meeting with this other person today from your organization. Are they going to share with me something that is a different point of view? So that they're constantly integrating those experiences and what they're hearing and demonstrating that they're listening. Meanwhile, along the way, marketing is you know running tactics alongside and providing um, opportunities for that company to learn more about um, our point of view on a particular industry or how we would solve a particular problem. And we're there and ready for them once the conversation can shift from focusing on the customer's business challenge to focusing on how we solve that problem. And I believe and we believe and see this in our um, in our uh, customer experiences in our selling process is that when you focus on them and their business challenge and and what they're trying to achieve, the customer is going to have a much better experience through the selling process and hopefully become a fan and want to be want to do business with us. Well, and, and I think also when you think of you, I mean, you mentioned like you know your um, state of smart manufacturing report, and a lot of companies are doing these kind of you know, we, we create a lot of these reports for companies too. These are kind of like white paper, thought leadership type reports. But one of the, I think, challenges with it is not just to make it a standalone report and people consume it. And basically you get a win if they read it and they become a lead. And then it just goes into a funnel. But how does it follow through so that, you know, the sales team even ha has an idea of what that report is and how it exists. If people are interested in it and some of the themes in it that could actually be useful for, for, for selling, you could help find a solution for them. How does that pull through? How does it sort of be not just like, you know, the front door to your sales funnel, hopefully they come in and do it, but how does it like mean something all the way through? And that takes more integration and thoughtfulness to do that. And maybe it's not just one report, maybe it's five different ones for each of your personas and one version yeah. that goes to the product operations guy at the food and beverage company you mentioned because it's different and it doesn't have all the technical details, but it has what's relevant to him or her. Exactly. And in fact, that state of smart report has been often, we have often produced it in different, for different industries, for different personas on different sort of trending topics. Um, and as I said earlier, you know, don't bother even writing that report if you don't enable the sales organization to be able to cut, to talk about that report and to be able to not just share it on their own, but use it in their selling pursuit um, and add value to the conversation through that. We, you know, when we when we release that report, we look at many different venues for sharing it. We do webinars on it. We reference the data from it in other other campaigns. So it it is a um, it's a a giant piece of work that we do but it's not a standalone piece. It's integrated into all the things that we do in marketing and all the things that we do in the selling process. And, and I think one thing that that is, is also interesting about reports is that they can also have a new life and become more relevant based on what's happening in the industry. So if there's news that comes out, if there's other things, then you can actually engage with reporters and say, hey, the, the, you know, there's this big announcement that's happening and, and here's what's happening in the industry let's let's look at our report. We have some insights on why that's happening. And so sometimes there's a little bit of a, let's build it 
we release it, ta-da, it's on our website, move on to the next report, but there could be a whole life of relevance to it because if it's a good report, it's probably related to industry trends. Industry news is happening all the time, therefore we can reference the report, but sometimes we forget because it was a lot of work to do the report, you know, let's move on to the next one. We got an editorial calendar to do, but there could be yeah. a life of it of, of its own. Yeah. And particularly that even helps out the sales team because if they're not jumping report to report to report and they they can leverage it more, then they're more integrated to, 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 exactly. to echo your earlier point. I think sometimes companies get bored with their own stuff and they don't realize that, you know, something like that has legs um, and can be used. You know, we we use that report for an entire year before we start working on you know, the next version of it, the latest version of it. Um, and and one of the things we're particularly proud about this year is that, you know, that report was a report that um, Plex Systems had done for many years. And Plex was really a North America focused company originally from a marketing perspective. We have global customers at Plex as well. But our marketing was largely focused on North America. And as part of Rockwell now, when we released that, we released it in you know nine different languages simultaneously. And the press release went out in all those languages. And we had our PR folks out in all of the regions, um, you know, pre-briefing um, various different influencers in all parts of the world. And it was um, a very exciting experience for the whole marketing organization to um, to see that asset be leveraged globally. Well, and sometimes people sort of forget too the the benefits on morale, excitement, seeing things that, that you've done, you know, sort of take steam ha, ha, has a big, has a big impact. Um, final thing I want to ask you about is just being a big, you know, historically industrial automation company, you're, 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 you have many other lines of business you're turning into now, but to what extent do you need, now need to think about, you know, just impact on the world, whether that means sustainability. And I know you do things like manufacture sustainable electric vehicle batteries, or you're transporting COVID-19 vaccines, or you're providing, you know, clean drinking water. And I, I know you personally have an interest in STEM education. How do you think about all that? Is that just like a lane of its own? And you sort of have to have it because, you, you know, you deal in resources and, and there's a lot of interest right now in protect, you know, protecting our resources and make sure they're there for future generations. Or is it some other way integrated more into the marketing? How do you think about it? Because a lot of people kind of struggle with, is it its own lane and we kind of just need to do it? We might be real passionate about it, but it's kind of be its own. Or is there a way that it ties into to everything else and, and even, you know, helps you close deals? I would say, you know, for Rockwell, it is core to who we are. You know, our, our, uh, our focus is expanding human possibilities. And so because we sell to... Um, manufacturing companies and organizations that are doing amazing things like life-saving vaccines like you talked about and electric vehicles. We're also in, you know, food and beverage um, across the board in, in, in a whole variety of areas. And, you know, if you've ever been on a roller coaster, Rockwell is probably controlling the motion of that roller coaster. So we're in all sorts of different parts of, um, of so many different industries. Um, but because we're in all of those industries and because of the work, the actual work that we do in creating industrial automation equipment um, and digital transformation solutions, the ideas around sustainability and, um, and uh, accelerating transformation and empowering the workforce, those are our customers' objectives. And so it's core to what we do. It's woven into everything we do. You know, we publish our sustainability report like many companies do annually, but we are also helping our customers achieve their sustainability um, objectives. And our customers are struggling every day with making sure that they are um, that they fill the pipeline with um, future skilled workers, and that's a, a challenge that Rockwell has, and one that we we through our um, through our uh, uh, sort of creating shared value, we are we are engaged with programs that drive more um, students and interest among young people into engineering and skilled um, skilled uh, 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 STEM related jobs. So, to me, um, and everything that we do at Rockwell, it's like core to what we do. It's not a it's not a separate lane. It's just infused in what we're trying to do and help our customers. And probably to your point, your earlier point, if you're customer focused, then 
that gives you the North Star. And it's if it's core to our customer, it's core to us. If it's related to our customer, it's related to us. If it's a problem for a customer that they're up at night about, it's a problem for us and we're up at night about it too. And that helps, it sounds like you navigate some of those things. And and um, and that's how you, if, if you have that as your North Star, that helps you prioritize. Is this critical? Is it core? If it is to our customer, then it is to us. And and it's a and it's a play, it's something that we can do to help them. We have solutions that help our customers, you know, with energy management and making those decisions. We have um, we our our solutions help simplify their processes and automate their processes and you know begins to shift the needs and the in their workforce requirements. And then we also invest in programs like the first robotics program, which is a you know a um, a global program to um, stimulate interest in science, technology, engineering, and math um, professions, and we have programs where we train um, military veterans uh, in the advanced manufacturing and production roles, and you know many engagements with universities. So. We have so many, we're focused in so many um, areas that are important to our customers and trying to advance those those um, those interests for them. And it also simultaneously helps it helps us advance it for us for ourselves. According to Robin Sates, successful marketing is all about understanding the customer, meeting them where they are, and leading with their business challenges and desired outcomes. It's about turning customers into fans through excellent customer experiences and ongoing engagement. Robin says sustainability shouldn't be a separate lane in business strategy, but a core part of a company's identity and mission. It's about helping customers achieve their sustainability goals and also addressing the challenge of filling the pipeline with future skilled workers. To paraphrase Robin, at the heart of every successful business transformation is a deep commitment to the customer. It's about seeing their challenges as our challenges their goals as our goals. For Top CMO, I'm Ben Kaplan.